and there is a little bit of a story to do there is a little bit of a story to do with this fact of him uh, knowing what he wants so we had the great privilege of a very famous rabbi in those days his name was rabbi shimshon pinkus was one of the greatest rabbis of his generation sadly he passed away very young uh, because of a uh, car accident and he, because he was a person who was interested in small communities and development of uh, places of learning in small communities he would travel all over the world including <clears throat> coming to us to santiago de chile so we had uh, an opportunity to have with him quite open conversations and I remember once he was speaking on the subject of the luxury and abundance and he took very interesting line because instead of bemoaning the consumerism and the life of luxury and saying how bad it is for our spiritual state he expressed completely different view he said that actually we have to use this abundance that we have in our generation as a springboard to thank Hashem for everything that we have and he spoke about it very eloquently and in his talk he also mentioned when he was talking about all the abundance that we have nowadays and he mentioned that in New York you can find an ice cream shop um, uh, where there are 101 tastes of ice cream, all whole of Israel. Said, could you imagine 101 tastes of ice cream, whole of Israel? So when he finished his talk, we were standing around, everyone asking questions, and Rabbi Malavsky uh, says, I have a question, Rabbi. And he says, yes. He says, the address, please. And Rabbi Pinkos didn't know what he's talking about. Says, what? Says, the address. Which address? The address for the ice cream shop. So that was uh, this, but this is not my subject, actually. What I wanted to mention, I want to mention another thing that we heard again from Rabbi Pinkus. And then I, at this time when we studied together in Chile. I don't know, maybe Ramlavsky shared it with you, maybe not. But I will tell you, and this is a beautiful thought, uh, which is very, very relevant to our situation nowadays. Uh, he mentioned a piece of Talmud in Tractate Eruvin, page 65. There is a piece of Talmud which says the following, that if a person got shikar, you know, he just drank, you know, came to visit someone, had one whiskey, then tasted another whiskey, and then third, fourth, etc., etc. He became drunk. And comes time of davening, and this person follows the halachic ruling that one, if you have, if you are drunk, you are not allowed to daven and he doesn't daven, following this ruling, that will sogrim sarot ba'ado, that will stop any tzores coming to him. Could you imagine, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's really very strange piece of Talmud, you know, nowadays everybody looks for some sort of things to do, which mitzvah you have to do in order to uh, protect yourself from uh, from the pandemic and from uh, all the problems. So you have a simple decision. You just go to your bar and you get your bottles and you get drunk and you don't daven and that's it. And you are protected. So Rabbi Pincus was asking, what is this amazing merit that a person, because he was drunk and he didn't daven, why uh, that generates such a tremendous merit that 
the person will uh, be deserving of protect of such strong protection that no Taurus will come to to his door. And he explained the following. He said, if you daven every day, three times a day, you forget why you daven. Because the reason why you daven it is because we have to communicate with uh, Hashem and uh, we have to pray to him. And this communication is defined by the law, by the law of the Torah, how many times you have to do it, in what state you have to be when you do it. But we don't remember about it. Uh, seven o'clock, that's my minion, I go davening, right? Uh, we, no, no one thinks too much about the reasons why he's doing it. The ultimate test that this person is passing in this situation is like this. I'm drunk. Now, I'm not drunk, drunk that I cannot speak. You know, a little bit tipsy. So I can daven, but if I open the Shulchanoro, Shulchanoro says Hashem doesn't want you to daven in this moment. Now, this is very difficult. This is a very difficult thing to stop to not to daven when you have not to daven because we are normally uh, used to do things by default. So he said, if a person, I'm not suggesting that you have to bring yourself intentionally to this state, but if a person happened to, for one or another reason, he happened to be drunk, and he understands in this state of drunkness, he understands that the reason why I'm davening, it is because this is my connection with God and not because I have my seven o'clock minion for Minche. He is passing the test. He deserves the special protection. So I think this is very relevant to our, to, to our situation because it makes no difference whether we are not to go to the minion because we are drunk or because COVID-19 is waiting outside on the streets. Whatever situation is, in both uh, situations, God tells you, sorry, yeah, I agree. All these years, I was very happy with you to go to Shulundavan. Now I have a problem with it. I am against it. So please don't do it. So this is the essence of fulfilling this statement of the Talmud, which says when you don't do something that you would like to do because this seems to you like the wrong thing to do, you don't do it because you appreciate that this is not what God wants you for at this moment, this is a very, very big merit. And this is something that really a person who observes it, he deserves he deserves to have this very special divine protection. That's very interesting thought. That, but I have to tell you, my friends, that uh, I am kind of a feeling that this Russia is sort of six weeks late, because six weeks ago, when uh, we had around the world this dilemma. Do we close the schools or we don't close the schools? And everywhere it was very, very different. In every place it was very different from other places. For example, in the UK, it's an interesting situation because in the UK you have a chief rabbi, which you don't have in other places. So, uh, yeah, so you have the chief rabbi, and uh, I remember it, it was the Tuesday, March the 17th. In the middle of the day, we got an email, and uh, I have bad habits regarding emails, so I'm not reading them straight away. So there, I saw that there is an email from the chief rabbi, but okay, email from chief rabbi, email from chief rabbi, I will have my time to read this email from chief rabbi. So I'm coming to shul, and our cousin is telling me, have you seen the email of the chief rabbi and I say no what it was about and he says well he said that the shul 
he has to close down. And without my rev, and we didn't come next morning. It was like by, and it was before the government, it was before everything, before before the government closed the schools, even before the government closed the pubs. Yeah, the pubs was, were still open till Friday. Tuesday, we were already, the schools were already closed. And it was terrible. And we had some sort of discussion because I'm in the middle of the year after my mom. So suddenly, boom. No Kaddish, I was like a little bit, uh, you know, it's like some uh, someone hits you on the head. So uh, there was a gentleman who had your set on this day and we started talking, maybe we'll arrange Minion. So we left Shul with the decision that we arrange in Minion tomorrow morning in, in someone's house. And then I read the letter of the chief rabbi again, and I saw how strong he was about it and I called everyone who was planning to come to this minion and I told them uh, my friends we are not having this minion tomorrow so I must say uh, it was uh, there were a few days of going through these dilemmas so then I think this piece uh, about not davening when Hashem doesn't want you to not not davening not coming to the minion to the shul when Hashem doesn't want to, I think then this piece was very relevant. Now it is less relevant because we are human beings. They are very adaptive creatures. So by now, I think when we will be told that we can go back to school, it will look to us strange because by now we kind of got used to it. So maybe now it is more to think about what is our real purpose, what it is that we can do uh, in this position being put uh, being put uh, in our homes. So uh, there is just uh, maybe there is some uh, cartoon I wanted to share with you which uh, maybe a little bit explains it, uh, my idea. Now forgive me for, it's not very, can you see it? Uh, if someone can unmute himself and tell me the... It said it started screen sharing, so you have to wait. We'll wait a few seconds okay. to see if, uh, yeah. okay. if it's a sharing computer or not. Okay. Okay. Is it coming now? Give it 10 more seconds and then we'll... Uh... It says you... It says you... One second. It says... Uh, uh, I, will, I will try. I will try it again. Okay, once. Let me, let me. Let me. I think I'm a co, so I think I have to play a role with that. I'll try it again, but it disappeared. Yeah, like it's, it's part of the. Hey, why? One second. One second. One second. One second. I will have to do your something. First of all, I want to open it, and then. One second. One second. Okay. I have to come back to to the to the call. Okay. Uh, and now let us try it again. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it is not very. It is not very. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. It may appear a, a little bit idol worshiping. I don't like God's images, but uh, I think the idea is very true. Idea that I think uh, what God's plan is is to open uh, places of worship in every home. Now you may you may think that it is a nice joke, but uh, there is something that I want to share with you that this is much more serious business than this uh, little cartoon. Uh, 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 let's see if you yeah can you read this one? Is is this one visible? Yeah, yeah yes it is it is it is yeah. okay beautiful. So this comes straight from the Nachmanides in his introduction to the book of Exodus. 
And here there is an interesting statement. Uh, so it goes to say, subject to the book Exodus, he's the first exile and the redemption from it. Now, when they left Egypt, even though they had left the house of slavery, they were still considered to be in the state of exile, for they were in foreign land, wandering in the wilderness. However, when they reached Mount Sinai and set up the tabernacle, and God reestablished his presence among them, then they returned to the spiritual level of their forefathers of having the divine presence upon their tents. And then they were considered to be redeemed. Now, my friends, uh, I want you to appreciate the magnitude of what Nahmanides is saying here. So you have all these long description in the Torah, which takes, as you know, several sedres, like uh, five sedres, to describe the stages of building the tabernacle, of bringing everything, of making it, of uh, putting it up, and eventually the great success that indeed the divine presence is resting upon the, these are the concluding verses of the book of Exodus. Yeah, you almost can hear the fanfare of uh, the trumpet, how the divine presence eventually rests on the tabernacle. Says in Ahmanides, when you open Humesh Breshis and you read Abram pitched his tent, the whole thing of the tabernacle was only replication of what it said there when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they pitched their tents because they brought the divine presence into their tents, into their houses. So he says, when they built the tabernacle, it was some sort of a replication of the, uh, uh, of the sacredness of the divine presence that was present in the houses of our forefathers. So now we have a little bit of a reversed uh, process, but it is no less important. You have to appreciate that. So when you bring a divine presence inside your house, this is a greater achievement than being part of the divine presence in the temples of worship. Yeah, that's what clearly Nachmanides is saying there. It says that the creation of the tabernacle was only a replication of what was there in the houses of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we are this generation who had the merit. I don't think there was any generation before us. We are this generation who has the merit of God giving us a commandment. I want you to go to the level of patriarchs. I want you to create this sort of sacredness in your houses. So every, <coughs> every day, every time that we do all the stuff that we were doing in shul, like for example, now we are having a, a shiur at home, every time that we daven inside our houses, we are creating this patriarchal a state of sacredness inside our houses. And I have to share with you, actually, I think I am the only one who has this experience, one of the very few people in the world who has this experience. I actually grew up till I was 10 years old on the basis of understanding that your house is your place of worship because uh, till I was 10 years old, my parents lived in the, in the Soviet Union and uh, in our town there was only one observant Jew except for my father and even if it will be Armenian, obviously they will not have an Armenian because it will be too dangerous. So my upbringing was based on the clear understanding that your house is your place of worship. So every Shabbos, uh, my father will finish davening, uh, will say good Shabbos, as if he came now from, from shul, and then will, he will make Yiddish, although on Halas, not on wine, because we didn't have kosher wine there, and we'll sit down to the Shabbos meal. And it was, self-understood that 
this is this is our house is our place of worship our house is our place for learning when i became when i was eight years old something like this i don't remember i think eight years old uh, my father Allah was all he had in the house only Humish and Mishnah because it was dangerous to hold some bigger books than that. Uh, and then he said, well, you are already eight years old. This is time to start learning more. And so he went somewhere, went to attic uh, some place, found there uh, an old, uh, an old uh, Bob, uh, Gomorrah Bob Mitzia, brought it home and started learning with me because there was no idea that education necessarily something that has to happen in uh, in school davening is something that has to happen in shul you can create the sacredness and the divine presence inside your house and now we are all having this opportunity so i think no generation had such an opportunity that each and every one of us can turn our houses into houses of worship there is a little bit more to it, I think. It is the whole, how to put it? It is a whole idea of not needing external things in order to get closer to the Almighty. If you want, uh, if you want an example, uh, it's. I'm sure you, uh, you all have read the the Shabbos. Uh, inside your home, you read the parsha, at least the first one of the two that we have, and there it describes the whole service of the high priest on Yom Kippur, and it speaks in great length about this concept of the of the escape goat. And at the time of the temple, escape goat was a tremendous thing, uh, because people they didn't have this duality which we have after the after the Catholic Church and after the philosophers like uh, Descartes and others who create this duality that spiritual is one thing and, uh, and physical is another thing, individual is one thing and community is another thing, clergy is one thing and the lay people they are another thing. Uh, our ancestors they had it all in very holistic uh, manner. So for them it was a big thing. So this uh, they felt this strong connection with the high priest. And when high priest made this action of choosing between one goat sent to this side, another goat is rejected. So they all felt that here we are participating in this act of the rejection of the evil to somewhere else. But years passed by and it became a ritual and it became a little bit of an empty ritual. And then what God did, just closed down the whole institution. You know, the Midrash says that uh, before, the, before the temple was destroyed, uh, few, 200, I think, uh, Kohens went to the roof of the temple and they threw the keys up and came hand or whatever it was from the heavens and got the keys. So it's before the temple was destroyed, actually, it was put on a lockdown. That was a most significant act, more than the destruction. The destruction said that the sages say that when when Titus destroyed the temple, they told him, oh, come on, you, you destroyed the empty shell. You, you didn't do anything. It was already on the lockdown. And what happened? No more, no more service. Okay, no more scapegoat. Now I'm asking, we as modern people, it's very heretical thought, so don't share it with the others. But uh, think about us, we as modern people, would it do us any good having... Uh, Escape God, I'm not sure. You know, we we are coming inside ourselves and we turned the whole service of Yom Kippur into individual work where you have to work on yourself, you have to change, you have to make a little bit of uh, uh, internal inventory and thinking about where I'm going further. So there is this, there are sometimes these moments when the external 
instruments for spirituality are removed because they become a little bit empty of uh, content. And then it is a moment when we think that God tells us, okay, now go inside. So there is, it is not only the physical act of moving from shul to home. There is, it is a symbolic of all that. I think it is deeply symbolic of the whole move from service which based on ritual and custom, etc., towards something which is much more personal. And if we utilize this time, when we will come back, of course, we don't want, has, God forbid, we don't want the normal services, we are not uh, reconstructed, yes? we don't want the normal services to change or to stop, but we want to recharge our internal feelings so when we come back to shul, it will be a different thing. It will be something that we, this sense of I am working on my individual personal closeness to the Almighty, it will be something that will follow us even when we go back to shul. That's more or less the ideas that I want to share with you today. I don't know, we have more time or you think we should move to questions and answers? We, we could, I think we could, take, uh, we could take a few questions. We could take, I think, a few questions. If there's anyone, you could either place it in chat or I don't, I don't see everyone. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm gonna start a little bit uh, asking, uh, uh, being, to be the first to ask a question and that is you are also a therapist what about the emotional toll? In other words, how much do you sense and or how do you deal or perhaps what do you suggest to people that are dealing with the emotional toll, not just from not going to shul, but it's a whole world that's turned upside down. Uh, 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 the fact is that we don't have a clarity of when this is coming to an end. Uh, reality is that we're accustomed to getting a little bit of a break. Even there's an enjoyment of going to a store. There's an enjoyment of traveling or planning travel. So there is an emotional toll that it's more than just the shul. So just in other words, what would you suggest when you talk to people as a therapist, as someone that is not just an average therapist, but someone that has tremendous knowledge in our tradition, what from our tradition do you give over to, as, as tools to address this very overwhelming situation? a big question probably I can answer it only partly now uh, I don't remember who said it uh, but uh, it's rather famous quote that he who has who knows the why can tolerate almost every how I uh, don't remember who uh, who said it, but definitely uh, it is, if we have the answers to our own answers, we don't have answers to why, but uh, here it is less why, it is more for what purpose. If we have our individual answers, what is a purpose that I can find for myself, uh, there is something uh, deeply satisfying about it. I can just tell you from my experience that I see people doing great progress. You know, people, someone, I was very surprised, someone actually, uh, a doctor, a medical professional, quite highly placed in, and he told me that for the last six weeks, he, st he started putting fill in every day. So I definitely didn't convince him to do it. So I was so surprised that I said, well, why, why is that? Because I'm not one of those people who, who get the idea of uh, that you get closer to God out of suffering. So he himself got actually coronavirus, although in very mild form, but he is part of the national, uh, of the national fight uh, against the virus. So I asked him uh, why you do that. And he said, you know, once 
I realized that we have no control, I started thinking to myself that it must be that there is someone who does have control. So it depends on your mindset. If you find for yourself some sort of a meaning, a personal meaning, I mean, for everyone it is a different thing. If you find some sort of a personal meaning in what is happening for you, like this fellow who said, okay, so now I start understanding there is control. Oh, I know a couple. Uh, interestingly, there was a couple uh, with whom I was uh, speaking and the wife told me that she's worried about her husband, that she sees that he is very worried and he is a little bit depressed and she thinks that he, it is all because he's worried about his job. And uh, okay, so I had later on conversation with the husband and uh, how are you doing? Uh, yeah. And he says, you know, I'm upset. I said, why you are upset? So he says, I'm upset because I thought that now that we are sitting at home, this is our opportunity to improve our relationship. Not that they have bad relationship, but they have their problems. So he, he said, I thought that now I have our opportunity to improve our relationship. But my wife is carrying on business as usual, and I don't see that she is trying to catch this opportunity. So then I said with the wife, I said, you had a mistake. Your husband is not worried at all about his business. He's worried, he's upset about if, that he feels that uh, you are going to miss an opportunity here. And you know what? They did miss opportunity. The relationship between them is now remarkably better, remarkably better. Yeah. So there are all these things that the person finds for himself. Eventually, sometimes, uh, there is also an opportunity to reflect on the idea that I may do personal sacrifice of my own comfort and my own interests in order to help other people. If I will start going around and I may catch the virus and I may pass the virus and I may pass the virus to someone and then, you know, this is Eventually, the person who will suffer, you don't know him. He may live in another part of the world because it can pass through 20 agents without harming them till it will get to someone for whom it is harmful. So there is, I think, person can get some sort of satisfaction by saying the reason why I am sitting here bored out of my wits not knowing what to do, missing my children, missing my grandchildren, missing uh, my shopping, missing uh, my summer holidays maybe even, etc., uh, etc. Et you know, there is this person somewhere in Paris that I'm saving her life. This is something that we have to think about it, that when we are making, uh, you know, uh, our freedoms is something that our, in all the democratic countries, our freedoms, it is something that our ancestors fought for it and they achieved it. And now it is the most fundamental part of the society that we have our personal freedoms that we have to remember. And this is another reminder of God sending us that as the world becomes more and more individualist, there is a big danger that people forget that my freedom comes together with my duties towards the society in which I live. And if we are reminded about it, and if we are sacrificing our freedoms in order to protect the society in which we live, if we really remind ourselves and remember to give a, a pat on the shoulder to ourselves, remembering that this is what we are doing, uh, that could be deeply satisfying. As I said,
from the very beginning, and this is only partial answer to this question, because of course, the loneliness and the and uh, the fact that we cannot do things that we want to do is very difficult. But as I say, we have to remind ourselves what a wonderful job we are doing. Community, I, I will just add one more word. God forbid, God forbid, I don't even want to think about it. Imagine that your community or my community will be one of those communities where people kind of, you know, uh, were very strong on their freedom and on doing whatever they want to do, and with the obvious results that we know from the news. How then we will feel? Yeah. You know, isn't it wonderful that we can say to ourselves, I am part of the community, when Bor Hashem, nothing or almost nothing happened. We have to remind ourselves about it. We we achieved we achieved a miracle. We achieved something that nobody uh, nobody else around achieved it. We have close to zero numbers of uh, you know. So, isn't it something to be proud about? Good, no question. Okay, Rabbi Kuberman, I also want to introduce you to someone who actually is a member of the community, but they are even to the east of you. And it's a fellow by the name of Jack Martell, who grew up in a city by the name of Leeds. Oh! Okay, Jack, what years uh, were you there? Let me uh, unmute you. You have to unmute yourself. Or... I'm not unmute, Jack. Can I unmute? Uh, Jack, unmute yourself. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. I'm to the, the introduction. Oh, great. In Leeds, uh, I grew up there. I lived um, near Motown Corner. Oh. And I left Leeds in 1968. Wow. But, but I am very familiar with many of your congregation. Oh, wow. This and is I, I called you a few years ago to give you regards from Rabbi Milevsky when I was in Leeds. All right, yes, now I remember. Wow. So we have the Leeds, the Leeds connection. Uh, My wife and I were married in Leeds in the old uh, New Central Vilna synagogue. You got married in New Central Vilna? In the... Oh, the old movie theater. The old movie theater. Wow. Who, yeah. wa who, wa who was officiating Rabbi? Rabbi Turetsky. Rabbi Turetsky. Wow. Okay. Uh -huh. Very good. And, uh, and we have here, good, good. Well, Jack, well, thank well. you for sharing that. Um, if it's okay, we're gonna, the, the, there's another member with another Leeds connection, and that is David Wolf. And David Wolf, will you unmute yourself and play a little bit of public Jewish geography for all of us? Okay, so my, my uh, uh, first of all, I enjoyed your, your talk very much. Um, my great, my uncle uh, was Diane Lerner, Yitzhak Lerner who was wow. a Dayan in Leeds, wow. he grew up in Leeds, and his son-in-law, uh, Jeremy Conway, who was the head of the London Bays, and was also in Leeds. Wow. Uh, he's my cousin, my first cousin. Uh -huh. and, and I also have an uncle and an aunt and cousins who lived in Gibraltar. The Roses. The roses were in Gibraltar. Revy and, Revy and Pearly wow. Rose. Wow. And, and Mo wow. Garson, the Garson family. Um, oh, and my, my first cousin was also a member of the Kolo, Shimon Rose. Wow. I don't know if that was before your time or after that your was, time. That was, he was before my time. Yeah, I think he was there in the first, the first go around. And I think Mo Garson was one of the people who actually helped to establish the Kolo there. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah, this, is, this is a little bit, the, he, here you remind me a little, another answer to Robert Milavsky question because uh, my wife years ago she asked Mrs. Rose how do you manage to be always happy because uh, I don't have to tell her that you ran she was always happy whatever will happen she was but not just smiling she was genuinely happy all the time and she looked at her and says what do you think I had to work on it <laughs> and uh, it was a great surprise because we thought that she, she's just sort of uh, what's her name no 
uh, this uh, Wendy Holden uh, sort of a person, you know, person that is uh, born naturally sort of uh, smiling and, uh, and happy. And uh, here it was a great discovery actually for us that she said, no, this is something that I worked on it. So, uh, you know, it's interesting uh, understanding that the person can work on themselves. We don't believe in it that much nowadays because we always think that we, we are very much uh, a result of our emotions rather than our emotions being a result of us. So we always feel like whatever our emotions dictate, this is how we're supposed to feel. Yeah, but here comes a person and says, no, maybe, maybe I was able to somehow build up and uh, direct my emotions in a certain direction till I got to this place where I'm becoming this happy person. So uh, for us, it was a big lesson then when she said it. Yeah. I, I'll tell you one, one little anecdote. When, I, when we visited to Gibraltar and I went to shul Sunday morning with my uncle Rivi. Mm. So uh, he was sitting down while he was putting on his tefillin. And I said, Uncle Rivi, why do you always sit down when you put on your tefillin? He said, I'm the only Ashkenazi here. And the halacha is that if you are, uh, if there's less than a million of Ashkenazim in a community of Sardin, then you have to, before Hesia, adopt the local custom. So yeah. I put on my tefillin sitting down. Yeah. So that was, that was the first time I, 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 I saw that. And it was amazing to me. Very mm. nice. Thank you, David. Nachum, is everything your brother said correct? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, Nachum, everything mm. correct. Okay. Listen, we do any other questions? Please. Okay, I was asked now to oh, ask. Yeah, it's correct. <laughs> it is correct. Nachum agrees. I've been asked, please ask the rabbi what practical words of strength he has for those of us who are completely alone and isolated. So someone asked the question. Um, in other words, people that are alone, what kind of chizah can you give for someone that is alone? Well, first of all, I would like to say that no one should be alone. Uh, we have phones, and most of us know how to use uh, the stuff like... Uh, you know, like Zoom and the Skype, etc. And first of all, we should not be alone. Uh, we ourselves, if we are alone, we should reach out. We should not be embarrassed to reach out because this is something that we deserve. We should be open to the idea that this, I, I, I think I find it, I have to tell you that I call every day about 10 members of the community trying to find out what's happening with them. And uh, I find that there is this special breed of people who live on their own for many years and they develop the habit of being very independent. Now, uh, being independent is a good idea, but the question where it comes from, I cannot start now explaining the whole attachment theory in psychology because it will be very long it will be a very long lecture but basically not every single bit of independence is a positive phenomenon so i have really sometimes to fight and with these people over the phone that they have to agree that someone will come and will do for them the shopping and sometimes i'm not successful in these arguments because they insist no rabbi i was doing as long as i can walk myself i want to do it myself etc what can you do but generally speaking, first of all, we should not be alone. And if someone is alone, it is also responsibility of the community to respond to the situation that the person is alone and to make sure that they get enough phone calls and they, they get enough, uh, uh, enough connections and whatever. Uh, otherwise, uh, you have to appreciate the fact that loneliness, you have to accept that these feelings are normal because feeling lonely, we are basically, we are creatures of of connection. We are creatures who need the connection and we have to understand that if God forbid we are left alone, it is okay not to feel good all the time. It is okay to have 
negative feelings. And uh, as I said, we have either to reach out or to allow others to reach out to us. Otherwise, we have to find the strength to do something pleasant for ourselves. I find it always the most difficult part to convince a person. Every person knows one person will like uh, will like classic music, another person likes uh, you know uh, action movies, another one likes reading uh, detective novels, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, or building. Uh, uh, you know, I spoke with someone amazing uh, for years. For years, uh, fellow is by by now in his nineties. For years, he was doing puzzles only of 500 pieces, but now he found a few boxes of 1,000 pieces puzzle, which he never had the chance to work on it, and now he's sitting and doing the thousand, uh, the thousand pieces puzzle. You know, <laughs> he was really he was really happy with it. But I say sometimes the greatest difficulty is to convince the person to do something good for themselves. Sometimes we have kind of uh, bad feelings and don't want to do for ourselves something that will feel good. We feel like we don't want uh, to do this action which somehow will make me feel good because I think that in this situation I should feel bad. So this is the small barrier that we have to overcome. We have to remember it is impossible that there is nothing in the world that I don't like doing. Baking cookies, eating them, I don't know, what, what, whatever, whatever ideas one can have, we have to remember everyone has something that they enjoy doing. And sometimes we have a little bit to force ourselves to do things that we enjoy doing. Uh, but once we pass this barrier, uh, it feels differently. So really, as I said, I think my my approach will be uh, built on three parts. A, reach out and allow others to reach out to you. B, accept the fact that it is okay to feel bad because your situation is not good. So it is indeed okay to feel bad. And C, remember what it is that you like doing and force yourself to uh, start doing it. Thank you very much. And this is an opportunity in the name of the whole uh, community and all of us who participated to thank Rabbi Cooperman. Uh, this thank has been a privilege and honor uh, for me to reconnect. Yes, to reconnect with Rabbi Cooperman uh, from many years ago. And it uh, brings happiness to see that you're doing and using your, your toolbox. God Almighty gave you a magnificent toolbox and it is nice to see that you are using it. So we thank you. We thank you very much during this period of time. I could say in the name of everyone here that it was indeed a wonderful experience. Uh, we hope the family is doing well. I shared before you, you got on how I remember a Pesach of 1994 of your son Shimon, who was five at the time, sitting on your lap as we celebrated the second Seder together. We have many good memories. Uh, so it's nice to see you and hopefully we could stay connected. And really thank you. This is much appreciated. This is a wonderful, wonderful gathering. So thank you, Rabbi Kuperman, and Atzlachar Rabbah, and only good things for you, the family, and the community in Leeds. Thank oh, you. Amen. Oh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And thank you all for being uh, with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.